Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today on this fantastic and insightful webinar um, where we will hear from an expert panel of speakers who will speak to a very important topic on how and why choosing the right energy storage system is important. So my name is Jin No. I'm the policy director of the California Energy Storage Alliance. In this role, um, I aim to increase the market opportunities for and improve the value of energy storage as an asset class while also aiming to uh, reduce barriers to their deployment and operation, operationalization. So um, to begin with, when we look at you know storage by the numbers, it's clear that um, California is the preeminent market for energy storage. We have over 4,000 megawatts of storage procured in California. We expect over 1,800 megawatts of storage to be operational in the ISO market by the end of September 21. And we expect over 10 gigawatts of energy storage before the end of the decade, if not more. And so even as uh, the California uh, market and frankly markets nationally and, and globally are, are growing exponentially, we know it can be a very competitive market. So it's important to be well positioned for success. And it is important to understand how you can be procured and operated in a way that is profitable, safe and reliable which is what we are here to discuss today, to uh, hearing from experts like Nuvation and Evlo. Uh, but a first, uh, a quick note about CISA for those who are not familiar, um, we're a, a trade association that serves as the definitive voice of storage in California. Uh, we aim to make our voice heard through effective regulatory advocacy and market development, networking, education, coalition building. Um, we're a big tent organization with over a hundred members spanning the entire energy storage ecosystem um, on the next slide, you know, including all types of roles, scales, technologies, uh, services, and business models of which uh, Nuvation is a member. With all that said, I wanted to introduce the, the topic of today's webinar, which gets to this very topic of you know, positioning your storage project for success. So while on the surface, a, a battery storage system provides a certain amount of power and energy at a certain price point, um, the reality is that the EPC and storage owners have to process a much broader uh, set of system requirements so that we ensure uh, both the short-term and long-term viability of their storage project. And so on this topic, you know, we'll first hear from Michael Worry, CEO, CTO of Nuvation Energy on some of the key considerations for identifying the right energy storage solution for your needs. Next, his colleague for uh, Joe O'Connor will share some examples of total cost of ownership comparisons. And lastly, we'll, we'll chat with Martin Rowe from Evlo Energy Storage to hear about some of their key go-to market projects. And so we'll begin you know, first with uh, uh, Michael Worry of Nuvation Energy, who founded the company in, in 1997. Uh, based in Sunnyvale and Waterloo, uh, Canada. Um, and to that, uh, maybe I'll turn it over to you, uh, Michael, to, to get us started on this exciting topic. Great. Thanks, Jin. Uh, I appreciate that uh, introduction. So I'm Michael Wery, uh, CEO and CTO of Innovation Energy. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer by background, uh, graduating from the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. Uh, I founded Nuvation in 1997. We're mostly going to be speaking today about my day job, um, where I do energy storage systems. This is an example of me doing some work in one of our systems in uh, Santa Rosa, California. Um, fun fact for me is my hobbies are also in energy storage systems. So this is an example of me doing some welding um, in one of our mutant vehicles um, that we bring to Burning Man every year. And so this is, uh, of course, a mutant electric vehicle. Uh, we have on board uh, Second Life batteries um, that run the fully electric drivetrain, um, as well as all the lighting and sound systems. Um, so the us, uh, this is us using energy storage systems to run uh, raves in the desert for you know north of a thousand people at a time. So for me, uh, energy storage is is who I am and what I do, um, both uh, during the day when we're paid and after hours for the love of the game. Today we're going to be talking about um, choosing the right energy storage system for your specific application. Um, to uh, introduce, uh, I'm co-presenting here uh, between Nuvation and Evlo, and uh, Evlo is a subsidiary of Hydro-Quebec, and uh, Martin will be presenting them later and all of the um, hundreds of terawatt hours that, uh, that they produce every year. 
Um, Evlo uh, builds their energy storage system using Nuvation's battery management system and, uh, and also Nuvation is a reseller uh, of Evlo energy storage systems. So uh, they're what we call a CVP, uh, client vendor partner. Um, there are times where uh, Evlo is purchasing Nuvation's battery management system. Um, there are other times um, where we are reselling their energy storage system. And all in all, we have a partnership that goes back many years. So let's uh, talk to a minute about what would be the perfect energy storage system. So we could, if we could wave a magic wand and, uh, and pretend what would be perfect, what would it be? Well, we would start with um, that it would have zero safety risk. Uh, it would have immediate availability. Uh, it would, of course, have no downtime and it would have no maintenance but it doesn't end there. We would continue to build on that and say, well, of course there's no on-site assembly. Uh, I'm gonna check the box for infinite cycle life um, and I'm gonna fully expect that this system have unlimited capacity. Um, and of course it's free. <laughs> so, so I'm teasing a little bit, um, but I'll kid you not, I've had customers that have asked for everything on that list. Um, let's actually uh, do a little poll and um, see what people think is the most important parameters for them inside of an energy storage system. So uh, Jake, let me uh, hand it to you for, uh, for our first poll. So we'll give people uh, 10 seconds or so to select um, which of these options is the most important for them uh, inside of selecting a energy storage system. Um, you know, is it the most reliable? Is it the quickest delivery? Is it the lowest upfront cost? Um, perhaps the lowest risk of a thermal event? Or are we interested in perhaps the lowest lifetime cost? So we'll give people a few seconds to select. All right, Jake, let's uh, see what people came back with. All right, so uh, so wow, we've got an even split between what is the uh, lowest uh, lifetime cost and, uh, and what is uh, most reliable. Um, so cool to see that uh, people are putting uh, value on both of those. Um, also, uh, highly important um, to have a, a low risk of, of thermal event, um, and uh, some people uh, chiming in on uh, lowest upfront cost and, uh, and uh, less on delivery. Okay, interesting. So what, uh, what is key inside of that uh, is that there is no uh, perfect energy storage system. Um, there isn't a, a set of requirements um, that uh, meets all needs. Uh, and so you actually end up looking at a wide variety of different energy storage systems across different applications. Um, here are actually four, uh, four examples uh, of energy storage systems built using Innovation's battery management system. Um, the first one is an island microgrid uh, eco resort off of Panama. This is a 48 fold lead acid system, uh, 27 stacks. Um, that's quite different from the next one. Um, so this is a high power system, a 4C 15 minute battery uh, installed at a, a plant in Santa Rosa, California with a full custom energy storage uh, container design. Um, this is an Evlo example of the, a five hour front of the meter energy storage system, 20 megawatt hours um, using the, the Evlo 1000. Um, and then this last one is a mobile energy storage system uh, where this is a, a NMC modules that are built to meet the shock and vibration requirements uh, of a mobile application. So all four of these are, you know, very different energy storage system designs um, uh, with different trade-offs in, in upfront cost, in, in lifetime costs, um, in reliability. Um, and so in each one of these, the point is uh, you can work with a company like Nuvation that does energy storage and figure out the requirements for your specific energy storage system um, and will uh, help you select that um, or design to that. Uh, talking about uh, requirements for an energy storage system, uh, one of the most important parameters is looking at nameplate versus usable energy. So let's define what these terms are. So the nameplate energy uh, is really like the nominal capacity. And so you take the nominal stack voltage and multiply it by the capacity, the amp hours um, of the battery cell or battery node, and you get to a nominal capacity. The advantage of looking at nameplate energy is it's very easy to calculate. You can just read it right off the data sheet. However, it doesn't represent uh, the amount of energy that is actually usable. Um, the usable energy we define is the amount of energy delivered uh, at the AC meter. And that includes, uh, accounts for all of the energy losses in the energy storage system. Um, so for example, that's uh, energy that's uh, used for HVAC, um, energy that's lost to heat and resist losses, um, and, uh, and also energy that's set aside uh, for uh, the amount of depth of discharge that you have in a system. 
So let's take three systems and uh, compare what this looks like. So in this first example, this is a four hour resiliency system. Um, and so because it's a resiliency application, it's a fairly low cycle count. And so we don't need to allocate a lot uh, of uh, energy um, to your uh, top and bottom state of charge reserve. Uh, and because it's a relatively low cycle count, we don't need to allocate a lot towards state of health aging. Uh, and so this allows us to be up in the 80s uh, of the percent of the nameplate that is actually usable energy. However, if we compare that to a, a one hour energy storage system that's doing daily cycling, you know, that's a, a higher power system. Um, and if it's doing daily cycling and you want this to last 10 or 15 years, you're not going to be doing 100% depth of discharge. Uh, you're going to be leaving some amount of allocation uh, for uh, top and bottom, as well as some amount for aging. So your, your end of life uh, is where it needs to be. And so your usable energy is going to be lower. You know, we're going to be in like the 63% uh, type range for, for usable energy. And then as a third example, um, in a demand charge management application, um, it's probably lower power. Um, and it might not be full uh, cycling. Uh, and so you don't need to allocate quite as much um, to uh, full depth of discharge um, or, uh, or full usage of a daily cycle. And so you actually get up into like a 70% type range of usable energy. So what's fascinating is in all three of these cases, this could actually be the identical hardware um, inside of the energy storage system. Um, and it's actually how the energy storage system is used um, that defines what the usable energy is. So an important thing to think about is how to size an energy storage system for the site requirements when you're responding to an RFQ. Um, so quite often uh, RFQs will say, you know, this is the energy and power that are used in an application. Um, and you have to think about whether that's the beginning of life or the end of life. And so there's a couple options here. When, when you're bidding a project, um, you know, do you uh, reduce the excess uh, capacity um, uh, without significant buffer and uh, get in a good price? Um, or do you think about, you know, what the long-term impact is uh, of the system potentially degrading and plan for that and oversize the system, but maybe run the risk um, that other bidders don't do that and underbid you. So we're going to do another poll. So Jake, let's, uh, let's throw up the second poll. So when bidding on a new project, what strategy do you use to determine usable energy? Uh, do you use the nameplate of the battery, pick it off the data sheet? Do you estimate it from previous experience? Um, do you do a percent reduction uh, from the nameplate? Um, or do you uh, run a simulation um, using the site energy profile? So we'll give people a few seconds to respond to that. Okay, Jake, let's, uh, let's look at the result. Okay, so this is actually a, a really smart crowd. Uh, so 52% says they actually go through the effort uh, to run a simulation with a site energy profile. Um, so that's, that's awesome. It is more effort in order to run a, a simulation like that. Um, some people do a, a percentage uh, reduction uh, from the nameplate, about a, a third of people do that. That's a, that's a quick way in order to do it. So less, uh, less effort in your quoting. Um, and some estimate it from uh, previous experience. Um, and 5% and are at nameplate. So interesting. So it's interesting to see the, the spread among that. Um, really, the, the takeaway from a poll like this is that uh, selling energy storage systems, it's not like selling like toasters. Um, you actually need to be like in a conversation with your customer uh, as to how the system is going to be used. Um, because you can't just sell off the data sheet. Um, what we found is in many of our energy storage uh, system sales, there's actually a customer education process to talk with them as to how the energy storage system is going to be used. Jake, let's go back to the slides. All right, so another really important topic uh, is the upfront cost versus the total cost of ownership. Um, and so uh, let's define these terms. So the upfront cost is, is really easy to calculate. You know, you can read it uh, off of the quote, but it's kind of a simplistic point of view. Whereas the lifetime cost is a bit more difficult in order to estimate, but it does capture the, the full picture. The total cost of ownership, of course, being the summation of those two. Um, a really good comparison is if you compare it to purchasing a gas car versus electric vehicle. So I'll have friends say to me that they'll buy an electric vehicle when it becomes cheaper. Well, actually, electric vehicles are cheaper now uh, because you don't have to worry about spark plugs and oil changes and transmission flushes 
um, the maintenance is almost zero. The only consumable um, is, uh, is tires. Uh, you don't even use brake pads because it's all region braking. You then combine that with solar panels on a house um, and you actually don't pay for transportation. It's actually free uh, to drive around, no income tax, no sales tax, no road tax. Uh, and so if you uh, you know look at a bit of a bigger picture, the total cost of ownership of electric vehicles is actually lower now. We can bring that same thinking over to energy storage systems. The upfront cost is generally defined and known. Um, and so you have the price of equipment, um, you have the expected power and capacity, uh, and then you'll get a price uh, for the agreed upon warranty. Um, usually there's different um, prices for different warranty lengths. Uh, the lifetime costs are perhaps a little bit more difficult uh, in order to, to know. Um, you can estimate them, uh, but some of them will be unknown. Um, so for example, you can have planned uh, downtime handled inside your system, um, but there might be unplanned downtime uh, as a trade-off of, of reliability. Uh, you can also hit schedule delays when you're first installing your system, um, commissioning issues, system integration issues, permitting issues, um, and all these things can impact delayed revenue of how the energy storage system is planned to be used and can actually trip over into financial penalties. So um, having been you know, doing energy storage systems for over a decade now, um, our experience has been um, that uh, if you spend a little bit more on your upfront cost and put more attention um, towards reliability uh, and uh, thermal event safety, um, that actually in the larger picture, your lifetime costs are dramatically lower and you actually get to a lower cost of ownership. So this bit about um, you know lifetime costs, uh, how do I manage that? You know, how, how do I look at that? How do I estimate that? How do I know how I'm doing? Um, the answer is that you can use your battery management system data in order to understand how your system is operating. So you can do calculations such as uh, predicting remaining useful life in energy storage system. Um, our BMS also has the ability to do open wire detection uh, and detect in advance uh, if there is uh, issues in the system. Um, so we can actually detect if like a, a bolt has become untorqued in the system, our open wire detection will detect that. Um, we do predictive maintenance uh, with our battery management system self-check. Uh, we also have a whole warranty validation system where we keep track of battery warranty um, and consumables of components. So for example, our BMS has uh, contactor life tracking. Um, that keeps track of how many times a contractor is cycled, um, make sure you're keeping safe, um, and flags that for service uh, ahead of it being an issue. Um, one of the particular interesting calculations is state of health versus remaining useful life. So one can actually track um, the state of health over time, um, graph it on a curve against the predicted degradation model of a battery, uh, and then use that to predict um, when cells are approaching a threshold of a declared end of life. Um, what's fascinating is you can do this prediction um, using the same data that the battery management system is already capturing um, as a data analytics gateway. So you don't need incremental sensors. Uh, you can use the, the data out of the system uh, in order to track your remaining useful life. And this all rolls up into tracking as to how you're doing against your lifetime costs. Um, another piece of uh, state of health uh, is tracking state of health of cell impedance, uh, known as your state of health power. Um, so this is one of our high voltage systems and a histogram that uh, we generated uh, from that. And what you can see is there's a few cells here that are a little bit of an outlier. Um, and if you graph that, it's actually statistically significant uh, to be outside of the curve uh, of um, standard deviation. And so this flags cells um, that are potential candidates for replacement. The advantage of looking at this and tracking this and using this data is it manages your lifetime costs. Um, because you can actually schedule this to replace these cells in a, in a scheduled service call and do that ahead of those cells um, impacting the operation of your system or potentially causing catastrophic failure. So these are all uh, techniques you can use uh, to use data in order to manage your lifetime costs. Talking about cost, I will now hand over to Joe, who will be speaking about a total cost of ownership comparisons. Hey, Joe. Hey, Michael. Uh, thanks for the transfer. Um, yes, so today I want to talk about the total cost of ownership and comparing different systems that um, have different pluses and minuses. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a business development engineer at uh, Nuvation, uh, working with Michael. Uh, I have a background in manufacturing and industrial engineering. Um, and I've spent almost 15 years in the solar industry and more recently in the energy storage industry. Um, so just like as Michael put, um, you know, day job energy storage is uh, what I've been working on for a long time. And uh, my hobby on the, on the side is also energy storage. 
Um, this is us actually working on uh, the energy storage system, um, eight different Nissan Leaf packs that we built inside the Techno Gecko, uh, the art car that Michael is mentioning. Uh, I also wrote a book on off-grid solar, which is a, uh, a guidebook that helps you understand how to install solar and batteries. So um, solar energy storage um, is all very important to, to all of us here, gets us excited. So um, the, the total cost of ownership um, for three different types of systems. Uh, what we've noticed in the market is there's, um, there isn't one type of energy storage system. We, we've seen a lot of different varieties and I kind of narrowed it down to three here. Um, we've noticed in this first example A, um, this is a very large concrete enclosure that holds um, many battery packs on the inside. Uh, this particular scenario is using uh, LFP, lithium iron phosphate um, chemistry, um, and it um, has some advantages for how, how large it is. Um, the second category here is a large ISO container, um, uh, which is very common in the energy storage industry. And uh, this particular one has um, NMC chemistry, um, but this could be any kind of cobalt chemistry that um, uh, that is used for, for lithium. And the final example here is the um, actually the Evlo uh, 1000, and it's a smaller enclosure um, using LFP uh, chemistry. And the, um, the interesting part about these second two examples is they are factory assembled, so there's less work done on site um, because um, they're assembled uh, from their original location. So I wanted to look at um, the different pluses and minuses between these three types of systems. Uh, I think anyone who's you know looked at a variety of energy storage systems as the market is growing and seen these um, these examples out there. So some of the trade-offs. So we're looking kind of at the hardware cost. Um, this is more of a cost analysis. Um, so one thing that we've noticed is the initial price of a large field-installed concrete enclosure. Um, is very competitive. Um, the pricing looks very attractive. Um, a lot of systems have, um, or a lot of sites have, have done this example because that initial price is so competitive. Um, alternatively, um, a factory assembled um, large ISO container with NMC chemistry that can be a bit more expensive. Um, uh, there's usually also some customization needed on these larger ISO containers um, for uh, for each project. Um, those can be a bit pricey um, on the initial price. Um, but kind of sitting in the sweet spot here are these smaller enclosures that are uh, more purpose-built um, for the, the final use case. And so uh, with, uh, with that field installed system, um, installing the batteries is an additional cost that they have to consider and plan for um, on site. Um, that could be um, a bit of an unknown and be a bit of a schedule risk for, for a project. Uh, additionally, um, having to use cranes to move these large um, equipment around can be expensive to rent the cranes and to operate them uh, while using a smaller enclosure, moving it with a forklift. Um, there's some significant advantages there for um, installation uh, time and cost. And on top of that, um, there's a financial risk of thermal events. Um, this is a, a real issue in the industry that we're all aware of. Um, uh, we are seeing that uh, LFP is a safer chemistry for the in the lithium category, um, uh, and HJs are catching up and kind of learning about those those differences there. So now let's look at the uh, other kind of trade-offs, kind of the the soft costs or the ongoing costs. Um, you know, a, a lot of projects nowadays are looking for 20 years or more uh, performance guarantee. Um, these are large facilities that need to run for a long time. Um, it's not cheap to keep these systems um, up and running and making sure that there's enough capacity for uh, end of life. Um, a lot of times projects are planning for augmentation, um, which is just adding more batteries onto a site um, at a later date. Um, and we're seeing that um, that can be costly for um, for an NMC system that has doesn't have as good of a cycle life um, compared to LFP. Um, there could be a lot of batteries that need to be installed onto a site. Um, 
Additionally here, so uh, trained skilled labor, this, is a, this can be an issue for any field installed system. Um, there are unknowns and there is integration and engineering happening on site, um, no matter how much you plan and, um, and try to make sure that that um, system is designed correctly. Um, so the factory assembled really is a clear winner here. Um, on maintenance and component replacement, um, this could be somewhat of a wash, but um, there are some advantages by having um, a smaller um, factory assembled enclosure. Uh, some more uh, risks here uh, to consider are schedule delays, um, anything that could slow down a project. Um, anyone who's installed many projects in energy storage these days knows um, how this can be forgotten or or miscalculated. So looking at commissioning or integration risk, um, again, obviously a factory assembled uh, system has some advantages there. Um, and also looking at permitting and regulatory, uh, you know, this, this has kind of been all over the place, but uh, with uh, NMC chemistry, that can be uh, very hard to um, get past permitting. Um, a lot of fire suppression stuff happening for both the field installed system um, and a large ISO container can be complicated. Um, having a pre-engineered system that, um, that works well and is a smaller um, size can be easier to get through, uh, through permitting. And finally, um, a delivery lead time. Um, there can be significant advantages by having a field installed system. It's easier to ship out components and get them to site. Um, uh, so there are trade-offs and benefits from, from all these different types of systems. So these are just three categories that we um, kind of had a hypothetical scenario here. Um, the question is, you know, which is the best one for you and which is the best for the uh, energy industry? And it really depends. It depends on your goals. It depends on uh, what your priorities are on a project. So from here, I'm gonna hand it off to Martine. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, uh, CISA, for having me here today. It's a uh, really, really feel uh, privileged to be here in front of uh, such an audience to talk about uh, energy uh, storage. So uh, I'm uh, Martin Ram, the VP of Business Development for Evlo, and uh, what I love to do is basically to make connections between uh, client needs, uh, technology, power system requirements. Um, execution challenges and the commercial aspect of all of that together so i really feel i'm at the right place uh, right now in my role the um so evlo by hydro quebec so um, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of hydro quebec for those who don't know hydro quebec we have put some uh, numbers on the left side we're the uh, largest renewable energy producer in north america so in the current energy transition uh, that we're in uh, we feel that we're basically getting it into it with a bit of a net start, having 99% of our electricity coming from renewable uh, sources. And a bit more on EVLO, who we are. Well, uh, we uh, design, install, operate uh, so storage solutions. And uh, like the one we mentioned already, the EVLO 1000, which is our flagship product at the moment, we're around the 100 employees, and most of us uh, in the Montreal area and Quebec. And we leverage uh, basically two main things from Hydro Quebec, which is uh, uh, the 40 years of research and over 800 patents in the battery research, and uh, also the DNA of uh, utility the, that we put in our solutions. Um, so, amongst those patents I just mentioned, LFP is one of them. Hydro Quebec is a uh, owner of the uh, of the license with the alliance so in in other words if i may say we solve the utilities biggest uh, challenges uh, with the utility grade energy storage solution this slide um, i'm showing a bit of an overview of product and services that that we offer and uh, want to point out uh, and we touched on a couple of them already with uh, with joe and michael but the, the most important one, again, the, the, because they're important, we're going to the, repeat them a, a little bit. But the safety aspect of the chemistry, so the LFP is known to be uh, the safest in the LFP family. Uh, advanced safety feature, I have another slide just after to cover that. The life cycle or the durability 
is is super key and the ease of installation so that covers the hardware piece and probably the most important part on the software side a bit different uh, we we feel in the industry that having a fully integrated software suite is is an, an important uh, an important element as well as the remote monitoring features we, we touched on it already uh, it's uh, it's crucial for for warranty uh, management data and the cybersecurity, having NERC SIP ready, I mean, you've all heard about uh, those requirements and it's a requirement that is only growing over time. Uh, and then on O&M, our preventive maintenance and the state of health reporting stand out in the list. And on the added value services that we see, uh, understanding the grid's challenges is um, becoming a, a one of the, the priorities so uh, the simulation and modeling which is the second bullet on the on that section it demonstrate that it's a it's a topic worth invest, investing a bit more money and putting on your tr criteria list when you're shopping around for a solution provider and on top of that having uh, embedded commissioning uh, staff and expertise is also a differentiator in the overall selection uh, of, of a solution in our opinion Well, on the uh, safety aspect, I mean, uh, let, let's be clear, we, the word safety came up uh, already many times and uh, for good reasons. Thermal runaway is something that needs to be mitigated. It's something that happens. And uh, just to cover one standard, uh, which is one of, of the important one, NFPA 855, uh, as an example, uh, is one of the meet, mitigation uh, method to uh, the accumulation of of uh, explosive gas when the thermal runaway happens. So you, one of the, they give you two choices uh, in the NFP 855, basically a control deflagration uh, panel assembly or having active ventilation. So just to to bring you a bit deeper in, in, in those aspects, well, we at Evlo selected the NFP 869 as our main way of uh, mitigating uh, thermal runaway. So in in few few words, it's uh, to maintain the contain of gases, uh, explosive gas below 25% of the lower flammability limit. Well, a bit of the sequence of event upon a detection of uh, let's say hydrogen, for example, we would stop all activities, alert first responders, uh, having a visual alarm and sound at site, and then activate the automatic venting system. Uh, with the, the economizer mode on on the HVAC to end the thermal runaway as soon as possible. So the key here is to act as fast as possible before it goes too far and uh, and go deep into a, a thermal runaway event. On the right side is a little bit of a transparent view of the current uh, Evlo 500 uh, being installed with all of the safety features that you can imagine inside the box, the kind of things you don't see from the outside. And uh, coming back to the Evlo 1000, uh, we approach uh, the thermal runaway management a bit differently, still with the uh, section 69 and NFPA. We evacuate gases uh, from the roof, blowing air through the HVAC with the economizer on. So just to give you a bit of the complexity and the features that you could add to your um, selection process of uh, energy storage st solution. On this slide, really, I want to uh, point out the right side of the picture right here, which is uh, our testing facility. And the main reason is that you may have heard of a FIT that stands for a field integration test. Well, it's a, it's a requirements we see more and more, especially north of the border, but uh, a little bit more in the US as well. Well, the field integration test as a clear goal is to de-risk uh, the assembly and um, demonstrate to the customer the viability of the whole chain from a DEMS, uh, the PCS, and all the way down to the, to the, the battery uh, system. So we, uh, we're proud to have invested quite a bit. We heard the feedbacks and we saw it coming, invested the, uh, a significant amount of effort in having a world-class uh, testing site where not only we can do fit, but also special customer testing we, because everybody has its own requirements and uh, as well as certification and even personal training. 
So uh, that's another element to add to your list when you're going to market, looking for a solution. Are they able to demonstrate you a, a real size, full scale type of, um, of system? So this one is a 25 kV experimental line on the Research Institute of Hydro-Quebec uh, campus. I think I'm still good on time. Some of the use cases you see, uh, well, they, I think we covered it pretty well. Uh, different application, different criteria to select. On the left would be a microgrid system, which is installed at the moment at Lac Megantic uh, for Hydro-Quebec. And uh, really one of the main feature on those ones uh, and uh, a recurrent topic is really the, how fast we can respond to uh to to the to the signals imagine we have fluked or intermittent resources from either solar wind with the uh, behaviors of diesel gen set combined to a, a certain load so uh, that's a, a critical aspect that uh, that you would be looking for in a microgrid environment in the middle it's a totally different we say integration of renewables, but it's uh, in fact it's uh, a lot of the um, ancillary service market that we cover on the Tonnerre project in France that is being deployed. So it's a picture from last week, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's uh, basically doing a frequency regulation in the RTE network, and um, well, the crucial part of being uh, pro or providing uh, ancillary services that are critical like that is you need to be able to provide the numerical model, uh, power system models to the utility and have that type of discussion, not only uh, at the uh, upfront and just delivering a, a dry uh, model, but uh, you, you need to have by your side a, a strong team to uh, expand further and go deeper into those models and demonstrate how it's gonna behave on the transmission system. Um, on the right side is uh, I think, uh, Michael, you added on your slides, which is more a resiliency type of a application at Hydro-Quebec, where it's a, it's a backup power. Uh, and again, transmission system in a weaker spot. And uh, we're all already putting a lot of effort on providing the right assistance on the modeling side for the customer. So key takeaways from there, um to make sure you, you keep in mind when uh, when selecting the right ess for your needs well the application and the cycling definition crucial we see way too often a client going to market with a system that will basically do everything uh, ex ex excessively difficult to uh, compare apples to apples in, in those scenarios so at uh, least going to market with a clear application and it's a common thread for the three projects i showed before they all went to market with a clear clear application, a clear uh, way of operating it. And uh, I believe they, they did the right decision and they selected the, I guess, the right product. The safety attributes to be weighted in the procurement process. So uh, really not necessarily just a box to check, but they all, uh, they're not all equal. Uh, safety attributes are um, really important and uh, it's not something you can add on the way. It's there or it's not there. Um, so uh, make sure you, you cover that early in the process or in the qualification stage even. The testing facilities, especially when I was mentioning the fit, um, the fit uh, tests, well, the, having a, a pro solution provider with a, a great uh, testing facility would enable you to test and coming to the, the floor and seeing uh, the system in action, maybe testing your routines, training your personnel, all the, of the good stuff that you you can not necessarily have uh, with with every solution provider. And the financial strength, I guess it's uh, it often uh, a very important piece of it, and uh, definitely something to put very high on your list. So on that uh, covers most of uh, my points. Here's my contacts, and I think we we have enough time for questions. Jim. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Martin, for that presentation. Thanks, uh, Joe and Michael, for for a great presentation. Um, I think you know before we dive into questions, you know, one thing I wanted to I was remiss to mention was, uh, you know, how to engage, you know, logistically. You know, I, I see some people have already learned the tool. You can just type in your questions. Um, the raise hand feature and unmute were 
likely not going to do uh, at this stage. So please type in your questions and I can relay some of them. We'll try to get to as most of them as possible. Um, some are very specific. So I uh, you know, encourage you to reach out to each of our speakers individually for some of those specific questions. And so I guess to begin with, um, no, I wanted to say, uh, you know, you guys shouldn't be called storage experts, but, you know, storage arts artists or craftsmen in terms of like how much, how much passion you guys have for, for storage and, and um, you know, optimizing and, and just really diving deep into these very technical topics. But, uh, you know, with that said, I wanted to, you know, start off with uh, uh, just a level setting question for you, Michael, in terms of, um, you know, we mentioned how, you know, Nuvation solution can help manage uh, uh, warranties and and um, have greater analytics into that. I, I was wondering if you could help clarify what is the difference between equipment warranty, availability guarantee, and degradation guarantee. We've heard those terms several times, and it'd be helpful if you could clarify. Yes, yeah, great question. Uh, and there's definitely some difference between those terms. Um, then this actually rolls up into a system level. I know Martin uh, had uh, specific definitions that uh, Evlo uses uh, between those uh, those different terms. So uh, I, I'm going to hand it to Martin for this one. <laughs> well, thank you, for Michael. It's a, like a, I guess a burning question on my desk uh, these days. So you know, it's a, it, it's so important. We should have in insisted maybe even more, but it's it's a great question to ask now. So. We see it as really two main layers where there's the equipment warranty on top, which is really a break fix type of warranty. Typically, we'd see one year or two years, and you can extend it to, I don't know, five or, or more, depending on uh, on the supplier. So that's that's the equipment warranty, but the, the other layer is way more complex. So, so some say it's a long-term service agreement. Some would say performance warranty uh, guarantees. Well, we see it in two layers there. There's the um, the degradation guarantees, which is one thing that uh, is manageable by monitoring, monitoring the behavior, the temperature, the cycling of it. Uh, so this one is fairly, um, I guess, easy to capture, to quantify. The availability or the uptime uh, guarantees is, is another ball game where the you see more and more in the uh, the industry going from uh, I don't know 95% availability to all the way up to uh, well, we're seeing 99%. So imagine the, the burden and the responsibility represent to uh, maintain 99% of the time the asset. So you kind of need to be boots on the ground with the, uh, the, the, the spare parts locally with the right teams ready to act on. Uh, well, it comes with a bigger cost uh, and a bigger liability. So it, the way you define your needs and your appetite for all of those uh, those layers is uh, really critical and uh, really, frankly, difficult to put on a level playing field. But uh, really, that's uh, that's why we're talking about it now. I think it's a uh, part education and part uh, risk management, but uh, really interesting topic. And uh, the the perfor performance guarantees is really the one to uh, take a, a lot of uh, attention to. During your your process, yeah, uh, that that's really helpful. And um, another great question actually came in from from uh, the attendees here. You know, maybe this is uh, uh, directed towards you, Michael, as to you know you have you have the analytics and tools to diagnose the health of the storage system, um, even at a very granular level. But I'm I'm curious to hear you know how that could potentially be actionable. Um, because one attendee is asking, you know, when replacing these outlier cells, when you actually identify it, um, how hard is it to actually find it and and um, replace it and fix the problem? Um, sure, uh, great question. And uh, this actually comes up a lot when uh, systems uh, start to age um, because uh, batteries uh, age at different rates. Um, and so how do you manage uh, replacing a few of those cells that are potentially uh, outliers? Um, so the advantages of Nuvation's BMS is it's uh, highly configurable, um, and so you can actually, uh, you could replace individual modules ideally uh, with the same modules or battery manufacturer that made them uh, originally, 
Um, however, if those are no longer available, you can replace them with the same chemistry uh, of another battery manufacturer as long as they have uh, very similar voltage uh, parameters um, for those cells. Um, and our BMS uh, will, will work with that and it'll manage and balance the stack inside of that. Um, like as an example, that Eco Resort uh, that uh, we gave an example of, um, ideally you'd keep the same, uh, you want to keep the same chemistry per stack, uh, but you'd actually have different chemistries in different stacks. And the battery management system acts as essentially a device driver that abstracts uh, the batteries underneath that. So we've actually done energy storage systems that were a combination of um, power modules in one stack, um, energy modules in another stack, um, and even lead acid uh, batteries in a third stack or second life cells. Um, and they can all be managed in, uh, in a string inverter model, um, and that all works fine. And our battery management system abstracts uh, everything underneath that um, so that it all just works together. Okay, and um, Martin, uh, maybe, maybe a question for you in terms of, you know, Michael shared kind of a, a case where they're seeing BMS in action but just from your experience with with the, the projects, are there any critical lessons learned um, for, for some of the projects in the field on how it's actually benefited you or, or any challenges that you see? Well, uh, definitely, uh, Jim, we've seen, especially imagine in a smaller site where you don't have necessarily operators present at all time, you totally rely on those systems to alert you. And, uh, it's been uh, it's it's been proving uh, it's worth uh, many times actually. So you know, no no error that this week would be, and let's say a, a wrong set points on an HVAC for example, and will show up as a, a trending temperature raising inside the the compartment, and we would act way before it it it, it creates any problem. So uh, I truly believe we totally rely on those uh, on those systems to be not only there but used properly. That's a definite case. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, Martin. And we're also getting a lot of questions about, about different use cases and how that might fit in, you know, beyond the ones that were covered. Uh, Michael, I really like the, the presentation of how, you know, we can really differentiate usable energy and, and Joe, the total cost of ownership of, of really different use cases, which has different performance requirements for the storage system. But there's this question of second life batteries. I know it hasn't been um, as big uh, of, of the share of the market yet, um, given the fact that uh, you know storage costs keep coming down. Um, but we're potentially, whether this is just temporary or not, a new area where we do have some supply chain disruptions. Um, where Martin, I think a question was was directed towards you as to, you know, are you guys seriously looking at, you know, second life batteries? Um, and then maybe Michael or Joe, you know, a question for you is like, when you when you look at second life battery applications, how does that change, you know, how you optimize or, or monitor these systems? Well, I can uh, yeah. go. I can go first. I will uh, and leave it to to my innovation colleagues there. Sure. But the, um, I think the. the the second life battery uh, is something we've looked definitely. The thing is, uh, especially when we work with utility and the type of uh, requirements by the utilities and the, the guarantees and the warranties we just talked about. Uh, in our model, so far we've been sticking to the to the new only, and uh, I'm pretty sure that there's there's a market for it, and probably with different uh, requirements and different warranties and guarantees attached to them as well. But uh, right now we're uh, we're not in that uh, business uh, at the moment. Yeah, um, I, I could touch on this topic a bit. Um, we we've noticed a lot of um, customers asking about Second Life. It comes up quite a bit. Uh, we actually kind of categorize it into two different categories of um, pack rebuild, where you tear down the batteries and rebuild them again from the cell or modules up, or you find a way to just reuse the EV pack as is. Uh, and as electric vehicles get uh, larger batteries, you know, moving into the future, um, if there's a hundred kilowatt hour battery sitting in a car that isn't going to be used anymore, it's a, that's a very large um, uh, node of power that could be used. So when you take a small Nissan Leaf battery and you try to reuse them and all the labor costs to rebuild them, sure, maybe there's some um, cost disadvantages there. But if you can take a full, uh, very large pack, reuse it as is. 
um, there's certainly a market for that, and we have a lot of batteries coming on the market very soon. So Novation's deployed into the field a lot of uh, Second Life systems, uh, and as Joe is referencing, we've got systems um, both at a, the module level, uh, where packs are torn down, um, uh, modules are binned, and, and then put uh, in similar state of health groupings uh, into the field. Uh, and we've also done uh, full packs. So for example, we just commissioned a 40-foot uh, container in Norway um, that's comprised of uh, 40 Nissan Leaf packs um, still in the pack uh, using uh, Nuvation's Second Life Pack Controller. Great, great, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, see, see where things develop on that front. Um, uh, I guess another question is, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, a lot of this webinar is dedicated toward understanding, you know, why having, you know, strong battery, you know, storage system analytics and having a, a, a BMS is important to, uh, you know, ensuring that the project is safe, reliable, um, you know, really uh, adheres to some of the performance requirements of whether, you know, you take the warranty or not. But um, Martin, I, was, I got a question here from one of the one of the attendees here. Around, you know, how do we evaluate different, you know, BMS vendors, and what are some of the criteria you look for um, as to, um, you know, selecting the right one? Uh, are there specific standards, specific criteria that you go uh, throughout that process? Where we, we're obviously biased, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question, though. But uh, I guess the uh, the algorithm for early detections and the, the reliability portions are critical i mean we've we've been addressing similar uh, in a similar fashion the market we, we're going for more high quality and reliability uh, as the, the, the first two and uh, in it, for us selecting a bms that was really how we how we did it it had to fit the rest of our philosophy and uh, the, the the remote capability and the data uh, the data aggregation was uh, was such that we were able to aggregate it into our own B uh, EMS easily, and uh, I guess the collaboration with the, the the manufacturers, having them not only in Canada and US, was another key differentiator in, in our point of view. Yeah. Okay. So certainly in selecting a battery management system, you know, a high weight um, towards reliability, um, the amount of product that's uh, that's in the field and has accumulated uh, field time, uh, the configuration capability uh, of a BMS, um, and the ability to scale manufacturing. So these are some of the key questions uh, that customers ask us and the feedback we get uh, as to why they've selected Innovations BMS. And, and UL certification is, is a big topic there. Um, we have... Uh, we're the first configurable BMS that's reached uh, UL recognition for 1973 and 9540. Yeah, um, and, and you know, touching on safety and reliability um, a little more. I, I know that this is a really important topic. Um, you know, we see, we, you know, we track the news um, and we try to learn from them as much as we can and, and manage them all up front, but. Um, Michael, I guess the question for you is, you know, what are some of the best technologies to um, prevent, you know, thermal runaway? And, you know, even a, a, an attendee asks, you know, you know, do you, have you explored or do you have any comments on liquid cooled or air cooled designs um, to address that issue? Sure, sure. So a, a couple of points inside of that. Um, so the, the biggest piece in terms of managing and preventing uh, thermal runaway. Uh, is managing the, the system with data and uh, and you can you know manage the system um, and we've noticed this in many of the large systems that are in the field as you can see subtleties in the data of differences in uh, temperature or differences in cell voltages um, and that can actually be used to track down so we've actually found situations where you know the wrong gauge of power wire was installed in part of a system um, because there is a thermistor running just one degree higher than all of its neighbors and we're like there's something here and we went and looked at it in the field and discovered, okay, these cells would actually have aged faster, um, and so we we can correct this. Um, uh, Evlo is, you know, really leading the market uh, in terms of their uh, fire protective technologies um, that they, uh, you know, as uh, Martin presented, um, you know, they have the ability to do the water deluge, um, they have the ability um, to, you know, vent hydrogen gases, um, do that uh, automatically. Um, these are a, a lot of the key uh, safety parameters uh, that protect you um, when, when you have events like that. Uh, and then fundamentally, you know, there's a lot of different chemistries in the marketplace. Um, so, 
you know, uh, all, all lithium batteries uh, have a level of safety and LFP uh, has even a further level uh, of safety to protection from thermal runaway. Right, if I may add the uh, Michael, yeah. the, it, it all start from uh, from the module up. So uh, the, the the more safe uh, or the safer the module, the better. But as soon as you go at the at the level system, what I was describing in the sequence of events is how precise you can detect it, which is Michael's point, and then how you mitigate it. And uh, I think the the level of effort to not only uh, put put devices into it, but also doing CFDs, deep analysis, and and real life tests as well is a uh, key to demonstrate that to uh, to the customer yeah uh, and there was yeah. a question in there on liquid cooling versus air cooling yeah. um so we've we've done both um the industry does do uh, more air cooling um and uh you know the evlo 1000 is ba built around air cooling now and there's um you know uh, liquid cooling uh, it, uh, provides for better energy density. And so I think this is the trend of the marketplace is uh, to move towards um, ever higher levels of energy density. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very insightful. Um, yeah, I, I know we couldn't get to all the questions uh, that attendees sent. And, and you know, I just wanted to remind everyone that the, the uh, presentation materials will be circulated. Uh, uh, the recording will be will be um, uploaded. So um, I know we're getting a lot of questions there, and of course, a lot of the many specific questions you have. I know the the panelists encourage you to to, to reach out. Um, but before we wrap up, I wanted to uh, conclude with a, a quick lightning round of, of two questions for for all of you. Um, you know, to kind of uh, really distill all this into a few key takeaways. Um, I guess my first question is you know can you translate the importance of, of bms and and really um you know having strong data analytics to to your storage system uh to its impact on bankability you know, revenue certainty uh and or insurability i guess this is the first question i wanted to throw to everyone yeah as, so for me you know bms data is your data gateway as to everything that's going on inside of the system so if you want to know the bankability of your system you need to know how it's performing you can only manage something uh, if you have the data to do it so if you want to get into calculations such as your remaining useful life and that example that was given um, you know that's the the long-term performance of your system and you have to do that uh, off of data and that all comes from the battery management system I'd say the um, reliability is, is a huge factor of uh, good data. You want to get good data, not any data. Um, having factory assembled equipment um, that is tested in a, in a, a you know, good environment, I think is key for um, uh, you know, getting all those, uh, the, the right data into the system. Yeah, if I may, I mean, I echo what uh, Michael and Joe were, were saying. And uh, in terms of volume, yes, BMS generates lots of data. And they also, in, in ratio generating, probably the most important data, especially for, for safety and performances. And the rest would be balance of, uh, of system, PCSs, and the rest of the high voltage, let's say, connections. But really, uh, it, it all starts with the with DNS for, for almost all of the algorithms, uh, algorithms uh, in the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's... Really good takeaways. And I guess my last question is, you know, as we see uh, the storage market grow and potentially a lot of these project opportunities grow in size um, to the gigawatt uh, hour scale, you know, what should we, what should everyone be aware of uh, in terms of technology changes and how should we adapt to, to all uh, uh, this evolution? Yeah. Uh, and so like I can chime in, like we uh, continue to see requests from customers uh, to extend uh, our product lines. So like we've had for many years, our multi-stack controller that can manage up to 32 stacks of batteries. Now we're working with customers um, uh, delivering site controllers and plant controllers uh, where they want the ability to manage uh, hundreds, uh, thousands of, of stacks at a time. And so we, uh, we have uh, the multi-stack controller that then has above it uh, equipment that can aggregate um, multiple banks uh, of batteries together. And uh, another trend we've been seeing is going higher voltage and higher higher amp hour capacity. So 1500 volts is definitely the future or um, what we're seeing. Um, we're also pushing the limits on how much um, amp hours we could put behind a node or behind a 
seller module. Yeah, I totally agree. And on top of that, the uh, bigger site, bigger challenges. So uh, how uh, how to deploy faster? I mean, it's been the key for sol the solar industry to deploy and, and reduce costs dramatically. So how are we going to scale up the, the large scale ESS and have efficient means of cost constructing and having those EMSs that we're talking about, aggregating all of those stacks, uh, capable of uh, controlling as efficiently uh, huge uh, and gigawatt hours of projects. And that's, uh, that's stuff we're already working on uh, and able to deliver. Yeah, well, we're at the hour. Um, just want to say thank you so much for really leading a, a very insightful panel. I know me personally, I've learned a lot. I'm hoping um, everyone who attended uh, uh, learned a lot as well. You know, you have their contact information. We'll share the presentations. Um, and I think I just wanted to conclude by saying, um, you know, CISA's here to connect you with uh, um, Nuvation, Evlo, um, you know, consider joining CISA uh, and definitely follow up with me if you're interested in learning more about what we do. Um, we, we like to have these types of, we like to um, host these types of uh, educational webinars um, and, and really spotlight some of our members. So, you know, thank you, Nuvation, for, for your membership as well. So with that, um, just wanted to say thanks so much, uh, all of you. Uh, I wish we could you know, see each other in person pretty soon. Um, but otherwise, hope you, hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thanks for the opportunity. Honored to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Thank you. Take care.